what, how I think peace is related to the shared society agenda, um, describing what I mean by the term peace, um, and then give a bit of an overview of this idea of violence containment, which is what uh, my paper was on. Um, then I'll go through a bit of the methodology, the results, um, and sort of how I, how I came up with this number, which is essentially an attempt to try and account for the cost of violence to the US economy in a year. Um, so in terms of what IEP is trying to do, Institute for Economics and Peace, we're really uh, trying to strip peace of its utopian connotations and make it a, a tangible policy goal. So by doing that, attaching a, a, a number sort of helps. Um, um, so when I say peace, uh, I really mean this term negative peace, which uh, Paul, you mentioned yesterday, Johan Gautung, um, he's the father of peace and conflict studies. Uh, he came up with this term negative peace and positive peace. Negative peace is really the, the absence of violence or the absence of, and the absence of the fear of violence. Um, our definition of violence is the World Health Organization definition, which refers to direct violence, uh, physical forms of violence. Um, so that's in contrast to positive peace, which carries with it, um, I guess, all those sort of normative conceptions about well-being, happiness, um, uh, you know, belonging. Um, and, you know, to give you an idea, I think Gao Tung, I think he described it as cooperation for mutual and equal benefit, where uh, individuals and society are in harmony. So that really... I, I found that interesting when you break that down because it has a lot of uh, simpatico with the shared society's definition. Um, the, the two concepts, I think, are kind of similar in the sense that they're multidimensional. So um, negative peace or the absence of violence is uh, similar to the outcomes of the shared society's agenda in terms of the fact it's not represented by any one factor. It's represented in different uh, political, economic and cultural forms. Um, and I, I think... Uh, you know, both factors, you know, really are st similar in the sense of how they link to trust. Um, and I think it's probably self-evident to uh, many that, um, you know, a, a society that's composed of individuals living in an objective, uh, subjective state of fear aren't going to make good democratic citizens. Um, so, um, and hence that this quote that I've taken from a a book on security that um, fearful and anxious environments facilitate behaviours where individuals may become inattentive, unconcerned or even enthusiasts for the erosion of basic freedoms uh, and lacking sympathy towards others. So uh, we, I'm trying to sort of see is direct violence is very linked to uh, facilitating the kinds of institutions that are associated with the, the outcomes that the shared society agenda is trying to, to move towards. Um, so what I'll do just quickly is just map out some really basic empirical uh, relationships between negative peace and some of the outcomes of the shared society's agenda. So I've taken uh, 13 of the indicators from the Global Peace Index. The Global Peace Index is the thing that the Institute is primarily uh, preoccupied with in its work. And these are the internal indicators. So there's 13 of them. Uh, I won't go into too much detail because we haven't got time, but uh, essentially um, those are attempts to be measures of direct violence or negative peace. Um, and the weightings are derived by expert panel. They're not derived by empirical uh, technique. Um, so I just thought, you know, and this is one of the benefits of being on the second day is that I get to sort of uh, moderate my presentation a little bit based on what people were talking about yesterday. And I just thought, because of all the conversation about inequality, just to sort of have a brief discussion, um, this is just the, the, uh, the internal peace score, uh, which the closer to one you are, the more peaceful you are, um, mapped against Jenny. And th there's a vague relationship there. Um, but it becomes a little bit more interesting when you break it up by uh, levels of economic development. So um, in the OECD countries, it's, it, it's a much more... Um, I guess, significant factor, um, even though you've got one outlier there in Chile uh, and Mexico's in the red. Um, 
And then, you know, conversely, if you take, take it to Africa, um, uh, yeah, the relationship is actually the opposite. You know, a little bit of inequality is associated with, um, with uh, you know, uh, lower or higher peace. Um, and like you were saying, Guang Ha yesterday, is that you sometimes need a little bit of inequality uh, for development. Um, just to show a quick relationship between negative peace and um, corruption, so that's just uh, the negative peace score against the world governance indicators, um, and negative peace against civic activism, which is this um, composite index put together by the Indices for Social Development, uh, which is all based on survey data. Um, and that's, that's uh, quite an interesting relationship too. So, uh, and incidentally, their other metric of intergroup cohesion is, is also uh, correlated, although there are some, some factors that are similar. So um, it's, yeah, it's a bit difficult to disaggregate what's happening there. Um, so this is really just to say that, the, you know, that there's a, you know, a broad relationship. Uh, it's not definitive by any means, obviously, and, uh, you know, further research would, it would be good if it could tease out the mechanisms uh, through which, you know, violence actually is related to social cohesion, civic activism and these other uh, factors. Um, so then I thought just to sort of take, the, take this further is um, uh, looking at uh, peace at the sub-national level within the US. So last year we compiled a, a, another index, a composite index of uh, direct violence um, in the US. And uh, basically that had five indicators, uh, incarceration, violent crime, homicide, number of police uh, and availability of small arms, all very almost evenly weighted. And um, just correlating that against Robert Putnam's um, social capital uh, uh, index, which I think he did in 2000, which is based on survey data on, uh, you know, number of people in clubs and associations and uh, stuff like that. And it's quite a striking uh, correlation. So the more peaceful states tend to have higher social capital. Um, and that's obviously accounting for the fact that, uh, acknowledging the fact that, um, uh, you know, that social capital can be represented in its positive and negative forms. You know, there are some associations that can be quite negative. Um, I think, Paul, you were saying at lunch yesterday, the Ku Klux Klan is the, um, is the best example of that. So there can be negative ex externalities. It's not necessarily a straightforward thing. Um, so. Now to the to point of my paper, um, and I just wanted to do that just to sort of show the, the basic relationship between uh, negative peace and the, the, sh the outcomes of shared societies. Um, on, on this paper, so what, what I'm trying to do is by putting a, a cost on violence, uh, it's just one tangible mechanism for one to be able to see the value of a shared society's agenda. Um, and so what I've done is um, define this entire category of economic activity as, uh, that's related to violence. So it's, the definition is public or private sector economic activity that either inflicts, prevents, responds to, and deals with the consequences of violence. So the things that it includes in the US are things like the uh, defense budget, uh, law enforcement, uh, the corrections budget, uh, the whole plethora of counterinsurgency, counterterrorism, counter homeland security spending, which is <coughs> very big in the US. Um, uh, all the sort of security around transport, border control, um, and we've also tried to account for um, the expenses uh, that households incur in terms of, you know, buying, uh, buying security, security cameras, locks, um, uh, and you know the the direct costs of uh, legal medical costs from assault, um, and insurance premiums, uh, all the all the expenses on vandalism uh, from repair and restoration, and uh, and private defence exports. So we try to be comprehensive, um, uh, and I'll go through a bit of the methodology of how I've done that uh, later. Um, so just some basic, uh, you know. I guess economics on why violence is important for the economy and Paul did go over some of the, the key sort of factors yesterday in his presentation. Um, but 
the conflict economists often uh, point to the five Ds, so destruction, disruption, diversion, displacement, and disincentive. So destruction is pretty obvious. That's what happens when you have a war. You destroy the capital stock. That's obviously not good. Um, disruption is when uh, you know uh, trading gets uh, uh, interrupted between voluntary actors and uh, diversion. Uh, you know, the perfect example of that is um, you know, the transfer of skilled labour uh, from civilian to military purposes. Uh, many people talk about the, the, that effect in the, in the US. Um, uh, and displacement uh, and disincentive, which uh, you know, disincentive refers to civilian uh, investment being disincentivised by uh, high levels of violence. So um, just the, the theoretical background for this is this peace economics approach, which is, I guess, this nascent area of economic um, theory. And really, it's really an attempt to try and make a distinction between uh, productive and unproductive forms of production. Um, so the idea is... Um, you know, the, the, I guess the theoretical basis, and I've, I've put a, uh, just a quick quote here from two peace economists that we work with um, who summarise it as this. The purpose of economic study is premised on the need to understand the design of political, economic and cultural institutions, their interrelations, and then uncover policies to prevent, mitigate or resolve any type of latent or actual destructive conflict within and between societies. So... The, the normative element of this is that it's sort of really predicated on the idea that um, you, you want to design institutions and policies that help prevent, uh, resolve and mitigate violence um, and to try and sort of facilitate uh, a behaviour of um, peace-creating habits or non-violent habits. Um, so that's the sort of normative element. And I think... Um, you know, it's sort of, in some sense, it's almost self-evident that, you know, a society that, you know, maintains social contract norms that, um, that regulate behaviour in a cooperative and uh, mutually beneficial, you know, respectful, trustful way is going to uh, probably have less violence and by uh, virtue of that have less violence containment spending, so have less of this uh, unproductive money spent on things related to violence. Um, so that's just the, the economic background. In terms of the methodology of how I came up with this number, um, what, we, what we did was um, aim to total expenditures uh, in the 09-10 financial year. Um, we were only counting direct costs and current expenditures, um, and so we weren't counting you know, the indirect costs like you know, opportunity costs and you know, the possible flow-on effect multiplier that you might get from, you know, not having a, a person killed, uh, you know, the lost wages aren't, <laughs> it's probably a bit crude, but, um, yeah, so, uh, the, and, and I guess the, the, the real issue that we had with this is that accounting standards really aren't set up to, de to really count for security line items, at least in the US, so, um, in, in terms of trying to disaggregate all these lines of expenditure, it's actually, it's actually really quite difficult. And to do it in a proper value-added way, uh, the, only, the only unambiguous line item is really public sector expenditures because those are the final expenditures in the national income product accounts. So you can count those uh, and say that they're definitely value-added. Um, the private sector costs, which are about 28, uh, 23% of the, no, 28 percent of the costs in this, are not valid, are sort of indicative figures, I guess, because of that problem. Um, so what we try to do is have line items for each, uh, well, methodologies for each line item. And that, that, that's not in the paper because it's very long and boring, um, but you can look at it in the final, uh, in, a, in a fuller and final version, I guess. Um, so this is the result. Um, and it comes out to 15% of GDP, US GDP, on violence containment, um, which is quite a big uh, part of the economy. Um, the majority of the expenditure is, is the public sector uh, expenditure at the top in the light blue. That's about 10.8% of GDP. 
you know, the majority of that is national defence, uh, Department of Defence spending, uh, veterans affairs, homeland security, and the debt service on the uh, on the military related uh, loans, um, uh, and that that includes uh, CIA, FBI, all the all the uh, counterterrorism uh, bodies as well. Um, and then you've got this very big uh, expenditure as well in uh, police, justice, uh, corrections, um, and and other includes local level expenditures. So the kinds of things that local governments do on security, you know, uh, uh, locks and uh, you know homeland security spending on uh, you know protecting dams and uh, streets and critical sites. Um, then the private sector uh, spending is, this is the sort of bit that's a bit more difficult to calculate and I've sort of made an attempt to sort of break these up into categories. Um, but, uh, you know, that overall has a much smaller percentage of the total amount and we're trying to be conservative in the way that we've done this so we're not uh, overestimating it. Um, and obviously it's quite striking when you think about the fact that it's, that, that size of money is equivalent to $15,000 for each American taxpayer. Um, and I just, just to put it in perspective, I, I'm just showing some, <coughs> I guess, the, the size of the, if you, if you made violence containment a uh, contiguous industry, it would be bigger than all the other industries um, at that size. Um, and similarly, 2.16 trillion is, is a very big amount of money. It's equivalent to, you know, if you take out the US, the sixth largest GDP in the world. So. It's a huge cost um, that, that the U.S. Uh, economy is, is using on this on violence. Um, just to give an idea of the, the breakdown, um, uh, so this is the, the public sector breakdown, and I, as I say, the majority is, is this uh, national defense, federal government spending. Um, and this is really the, the expense that's been growing in the US in the last 10 years, um, uh, especially in the areas of uh, uh, veterans affairs, homeland security, um, and of course, because of the cost of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, um, that, that has been going up significantly. Um, the private sector uh, is broken up into, into this, uh, sort of taxonomy. Um, I categorise the consequences of violence as having the, the biggest contribution to this amount. And so that includes things like uh, victim, you know, the, the spending on victim compensation uh, programs, people who have suffered from domestic violence and, um, uh, you know, violent crime, uh, the property loss from arson, um, healthcare costs for children that have suffered abuse, um, uh, you know, the medical costs of, of uh, violent crime and costs of vandalism, etc. So that, that really has the majority of the private sector expenditure. Um, and then what I tried to do is uh, go take this back um, and sort of look at some kind of trend. And it, it's very difficult to do this because you'd have to, to do it properly for the private sector at least, you'd have to attempt to count for each year, which would be incredibly difficult, um, but if you just isolate the, that private sector expenditure or forget about it, uh, this is the growth in the, um, in the public sector violence containment. So this just shows the, the quite significant um, increase um, since 2000. And then what I, just to sort of illustrate, and this is just for illustrative purposes, just to sort of show the sort of direct link between violence and cost, and by proxy, shared societies and cost. Um, this is the map of uh, US peace index, which, so in the darker shades of the less peaceful states. Um, and then we attributed a costing methodology of just the static cost, which was essentially just medical cost from violent crime and homicide, uh, the cost of um, uh, uh, corrections, uh, the police budgets, um, uh, judicial spending just related to criminal caseloads. And the more peace, the most peaceful state, Maine, you know, spends about $250 per person. Uh, you know, a middle state like Michigan, 
you know, is around about 400, and Louisiana is, you know, more than double. So that just sort of illustrates, you know, that the, this direct violence can be put into, you know, a, a transferred into a figure, basically, and a, and a cost attributed. It. Um, so just in summary, um, I, I, I think this concept, you know, probably needs to be, uh, all I've really done is try to account for the number. It's an accounting exercise. Um, I think, you know, the next step if, for this analysis would be to try and, you know, investigate how efficient these expenditures are. So it's, it's not to say that uh, spending on security is bad. It's to say what is the most optimal spending on security and what's, what's the best combination of public and private spending on security. Is there duplication? You know, is is it is it efficient? Um, and then secondly, um, the I think it's just an important point in summary is that uh, not really acknowledging the opportunity costs and the trade-offs that you are getting when state governments in the U.S. at least or, and the federal government is spending this size of money on short-term violence containment. So a lot of these things are just to contain, you know, the, the basic needs. Um, that money could, you know, obviously be transferred into other productivity enhancing investments like health, education um, uh, and infrastructure. Um, so you do have this, this trade-off and there's, there is a vicious cycle. Um, you know, as states spend more on violence containment, it, it necessitates a reduction of spending in other areas. And, you know, the perfect example of that uh, as many people might know, is California. Who, you know, I think they now spend forty-seven thousand dollars per inmate on corrections, you know, which is the equivalent of you know a college degree, or the cost of a you know the yearly cost of a a, a, a law school uh, degree. So, and and they, at the same time, they can't pay their uh, their teachers uh, their wages. So, you do have this sort of shift in resources to, you know, violence creates a shift in resources to these unproductive uh, areas of expenditure. Um, so that's really uh, the presentation and what I did in the, in the paper is try and sort of highlight some fairly crude um, examples of what you could get with the kind of money that, uh, that the government is spending on violence containment. Uh, they're just there for illustrative purposes. Um, but I guess we can probably move to a discussion.